Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Phyllis Zimbler Miller, the founder of the free nonfiction Holocaust theater project, thenedgethewedge.com. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest in which was a, there was a small Jewish community. My grandparents had immigrated from Latvia and Russia at the turn of the 20th century. My U.S. Army officer husband and I were stationed in Munich, Germany, only 25 years after the end of World War II. This podcast is in partnership with Evelyn Marcus, a Dutch Jew and daughter of Holocaust survivors, who's featured in the documentary Never Again Is Now. She immigrated to the U.S. in 2006 because of the rise in anti-Semitism. Our guest for this episode is Arnold Rosenfeld, and he is going to tell you about himself. Arnold? Thanks so much, Phyllis. Um, yeah, my name is Arno. I'm a staff writer at The Forward, uh, which is the sort of national uh, Jewish newspaper based in New York. I myself am based in Washington, D.C. I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, so I think you're, are you also based in, in California? Yeah, in Los Angeles. Yeah, so I grew up on the West Coast, went to college in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and then I spent a couple years uh, covering politics in Wyoming, uh, also a very small Jewish community out there. Then I worked in, in North Dakota uh, briefly. I had a campaign job there. And then I came to, to Washington, DC, where I was working for some Jewish nonprofits uh, before joining the, uh, the Forward. And at the Forward, I cover uh, anti-Semitism as well as you know, sort of Jewish institutional life. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here and, and talk about you know, an important issue. So let's start with growing up in San Francisco. Did you personally face anti-Semitism as you grew up? I wouldn't say that I faced anti-Semitism. Uh, it was not a defining, you know, characteristic of my my upbringing or my childhood. Um, you know, I went to a Jewish day school for high school, um, and I went to a public school for K through eight. Um, so there were, you know, always a few uh, Jewish kids around um, before high school, and then high school. You know, my entire kind of social social circle was was Jewish. Um, you know, there were a couple incidents in high school that were anti-Semitic, the Westboro Baptist Church, which were the ones with the big signs that say, you know, like Jews will burn in hell and all that. Uh, they came and picketed our high school uh, at one point. Um, you know, we also had some, we would have guest speakers and, you know, they tried to get a wide uh, breadth of the community. And I remember one incident where there was like a weird, sort of a weird experience with a guest speaker. Um, and then, you know, there was some, we did have one kind of dramatic incident. I was on the soccer team playing against another team that was you know, not a Jewish high school. Um, and, and that was, there was some pretty uh, blatant anti-Semitism there. Um, but, you know, otherwise, no, you know, I never felt unsafe being Jewish or, you know, like I was other or excluded or anything like that. When did you first learn about the Holocaust as a child or as a teen? Yeah, you know, it's, it's such an interesting question because I was trying to, when I was coming on uh, and, and thinking about coming on, I was trying to remember when I first, heard about it. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, it definitely feels like something that was just kind of part of the, the water um, growing up. And not that my, my parents were telling, you know, horrific, uh, you know, stories about the Nazis or anything like that. Um, but, I, but I think it was just something that you were sort of vaguely aware of. And then as I learned more specifically about it, you know, went to a, a Holocaust museum or um, you know, read an article or something like that. It just sort of fit into, because I think everyone grows up knowing that the the Nazis are bad, right? I mean, they're just a stand-in for, for evil. Um, and so then I think as you start to learn about the Holocaust and the specifics, you sort of slot that in and like, oh, well, right, okay, that's, wh that's why they were evil or that's why, um, you know, that's part of what uh, makes it hard to, to be Jewish or the legacy of persecution, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint. I, you know, I, I don't think I could tell you. Your parents and grandparents were born in the United States? Um, yes, my, uh, yeah, my parents and grandparents were born in the United States and their grandparents immigrated at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Well, on my father's side, I don't know exactly on my mother's side. So let's go to the fact that you cover the anti-Semitism beat for the forward. So what can we learn? I mean, what would you like to share with us? And then what can we learn about how to educate people about which things are anti a Semitic, you know, uh, David Baldale's book, uh, Jews Don't Count, is I'm uh, really interested in that subject that things that people would know are offensive to say to African Americans or Asian Americans, 
people feel perfectly fine saying offensive things to Jews without realizing that they're anti-Semitic. Yeah, you know, it's such a hard question. And one of the things that I was most surprised about, you know, sort of coming to the forward, I started in October um, and started looking at some of these issues. Um, there is really no agreement within the Jewish community over what is anti-Semitic. Some things, sure, you know, if you attack an Orthodox Jew on the streets of New York City because you see them wearing, you know, what you associate with, with Jewish garb, anti-Semitic. If you say, I hate Jews, anti-Semitic. But everything in the gray area, once you get beyond those blatant things, there is no agreement. And even among the, you know, so one of the one of the big things going on right now is this debate over the definition of anti-Semitism. So there's one definition put out by the uh, IHRA. Yes, International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Alliance. Go ahead. And so, yeah, and so they have, um, you know, their definition uh, that is supported by most of the Jewish establishment and by a lot of pro-Israel advocacy groups. Um, and then there's the, the more recent Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism, which is supported by some of the more progressive groups and a lot of uh, academics. And But even within those two definitions, they both say, well, here's a lot of what is often anti-Semitic and here's what's not anti-Semitic, but it all depends on context. Um, and I was just talking with uh, you know uh, an academic today who was saying, well, so much of it comes down to the tone of voice. You know, if you say, you know, Israel's a, a disgusting apartheid state, you know, and, and you know, it's the, the worst country in the world, that's, you know, that's problematic in a way that, you know, if you say, well, you know, I think that, you know, there's a strong argument to be made that if you look at some of these legal definitions of apartheid, you could consider what Israel is doing in these areas, you know, to, to be apartheid. So the, the short answer is, it's it's really hard to say what's what's anti-Semitic. A lot of it, you know, it's become so politicized, um, which, you know, I don't want to say that it's unfortunate because it's an important issue, right? It, and it is, it does have political stakes, and you know, it it has it hinges on how the government responds to it, how institutions respond to it. So I don't want to say, oh, it's it's a shame that it's so political, but certainly it has gotten to a point where it is difficult for the average, you know, Jew on the street to to have a good sense of like. Is my you know member of Congress saying something anti-Semitic, or or is this protest that I'm walking past like are they targeting me as a Jew, or is this just you know about you know a political issue? Um, so yeah, it's it's tricky. You want to talk a little bit more about the difference between anti-Zionism, anti-Israel, and anti-Semitism. So for me, I when I talk about anti-Semitism, I personally am always talking about things about Jews as Jews or Judaism as a, as a religion, because since I do a lot of work about the Holocaust, that Israel didn't exist then in the 1930s when Hitler came to power and started uh, anti-Jewish measures. So that's what I mean by anti-Semitism. But as you just recently just said, sometimes it, it gets confused with anti-Zionism. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and you know, that's one of the trickiest, trickiest subjects because I have not met very many people. A lot of people say, uh, and when I say a lot of people, a lot of the Jewish establishment, certainly pro-Israel groups, but a lot of groups like the American Jewish Committee, um, the ADL, et cetera, um, you know, some of their officials will say that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. But very few of those people, when you actually try to pin them down and say, well, let's say you're talking to, a, you know, an anarchist, like someone who's super left wing and they just don't believe in nation states. You know, they want open borders between the U.S. and Mexico. They just don't like borders. They don't like nationalism. So they're anti-Zionist, but they're also anti, you know, American nationalism. They're anti every kind of, you know, nationalism. And they say, OK, well, sure, in that context, maybe that's not anti-Semitic. But if they're only doing advocacy around Israel, then that's anti-Semitic. And, and then, you know, and then you talk to people who say, no way is anti-Zionism anti-Semitic. Um, and you say, okay, but, you know, you look at some of the debates around, you know, boycotting Israel or something like that. And, and people definitely sometimes use Zionist as a synonym for uh, Jew. And so you'll see, you know, like, I want to get these disgusting Zionist snakes off my campus, or we need to root out, you know, the Zionist scum. In that case, it's pretty hard to see that as like legitimate, normal political discourse. It could be, you know, it depends on where the person is coming from and, you know, the, the type of rhetoric they use in other cases. Um, but, but it's really hard to figure out where to draw that line. Um, and, you know, I will say, because, you know, the, the party that often goes undiscussed here, but that this impacts a lot are, are Palestinians and Palestinian Americans. 
And, you know, they're often, you know, they say, well, look, I'm anti-Zionist because to me, Zionism dispossessed my family and, you know, da, da, da. So it's nothing about Jews. It's just my, my family history. Um, and, and they are really uncomfortable with trying to figure out where that line is at all because they say, look, Zionism is a purely political ideology. It has nothing to do with Jews as Jews. It's just ethno-nationalism. And then you have, you know, and, and some progressive Jews agree with that. And then you have, you know, folks on, on the sort of center, center right, and then right wing who say Zionism is like Shabbat. So, you know, not every Jew is a Zionist. Not every Jew celebrates Shabbat. But if you tried to ban Shabbat, or if you said, look, I don't have any problem with, with Jews so long as they don't celebrate Shabbat, we would all recognize that as anti-Semitic. And Zionism is the same thing. It's an integral part of, of Jewish identity. And, you know, I, I don't know that we're really ever going to reach consensus on that because I think it's absolutely true for some people. They say, like, I cannot be a Jew without being a Zionist. And other people are like, I'm not a Zionist. I don't care about Israel. I'm happily Jewish. I have no idea what you're talking about. And, and it's a huge goal. So how do we explain, though, to Americans? I keep living in Washington, D.C., Yes, there are lots of Jews. There are lots of Jews in LA where I live, but I grew up where there were very few Jews. And mostly the United States is still like that. I mean, those of us who live in major metropolitan cities with large Jewish populations forget that there are people who legitimately have never met a Jew or knowingly met a Jew in their lives. And so they're susceptible to being told things by others who also don't understand that they're saying offensive things. So do you have any examples you can share with us of someone saying uh, something anti-Semitic and how a, a response that could work in terms of educating people? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know that there's a perfect answer to that. I think that you sort of hit the nail on the head that it's important for people to just meet Jews and know Jews. And so I think if there's a way for you to uh, appropriately bring up that you are Jewish and, you know, that's a good thing to do. I remember when I was in Wyoming, um, I was working with a, this kid who was, I think he was seven at the time, was sort of mentoring him. And he was, you know, we were chatting. He said, oh, you know, I'm, uh, I think we we're listening to the radio or driving somewhere. And he said, oh, you know, I like this Christian rock station. I said, okay, you know, cool. And, and he said, you know, are you Christian? I said, oh, no, you know, I'm Jewish. And he said, oh, cool, I'm, I'm American. Um, and, and that's one of the things you hear a lot is this assumption that if you're Jewish, you either have Israeli citizenship. I think most people recognize that Jews are also Americans, but that, like the Jews are somehow, you know, separate or have a, the, it's a nationality. So it must mean that you're a different nationality. And so I said, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish and I'm all, you know, I'm also American. It's just, you know, it's a religion. And, you know, um, and he said, oh, you know, okay, cool. Um, and, you know, I knew his, I knew his uh, mom that, you know, they were not anti-Semitic, but I think it's just probably not in school with any, you know, with any Jewish kids. So how, how would you know? Um, and then, you know, there was another incident in when I was in North Dakota, I, uh, you know, I had a friend who was from North Dakota and I was in this town that was, you know, all of North Dakota is pretty sparse with Jews, but I was in Minot, which is in the far northwestern corner. It's kind of near the Canadian border. Um, I was there over high holidays. The nearest services were, were four hours uh, one way uh, driving away. You know, there was there was not a minion in this in this town. And, um, you know, I was talking to her and she went to school in Minnesota and she was kind of complaining about uh, the administration at the school and how they were kind of conservative when it came to, you know, racial justice and policing. And they just, you know, that it was sort of this conservative administration said, you know, you know, the president's a Zionist. So, um, and, and we hadn't been talking about Israel or, or about Jews. Um, I have no idea if the president uh, was Jewish or not. Um, and, you know, and so I was sort of like, okay. And then, you know, a few weeks later we were talking and I said, you know, hey, I just have to say, you know, now that I know you a little bit better, I just want to say that like it's totally fair to to dislike you know if your president is going around like you know trying to advocate for israel or do things that you disagree with politically that makes sense but like just fyi that like using zionist as shorthand for uh you know politics that you disagree with or like for some more nefarious thing that like for for racism or for something else in a vacuum like that that's you know going to make a lot of Jews uncomfortable. Here's why: it has nothing to do with supporting Israel. That's just like not you know. It's like you're you're sort of like the the hairs on my back stand up a little bit when I when I hear that because I'm like ooh like what do you what do you mean? So you know and, and she was like oh yeah you know that that makes sense. Um, and I don't think that changed you know 
my friend's politics on Israel, nor was I trying to, but I think it was at least the flag of like, oh, here's how, you know, Jewish people might hear this when I say it in this way, so I can like kind of think about that. And, and you know, I've of course been corrected in the same way by friends from other communities. So I think just little corrections like that can be, can be helpful. I think one of the worst mistakes American Jews have made is not emphasizing that Jews serve in the American military. So I have one of my volunteer sites is Operation Support Jews in the Military.com because Jews serve in the American military forces in the same percentage that we are in the population. And one time I had a disagreement with a Jewish woman who said, Jews don't serve in the American military. I said, yes, they do. She said, no, they don't. And I think that's one of the things that we as a Jewish community in the United States could emphasize is that we do serve in the military. We are Americans. I, lots of Jewish young men and women do go to Israel to serve in, that is, in the Israeli army, but that doesn't mean that young Jewish men and women are not serving in the army here in the United States or obviously stationed yeah. elsewhere in the world, but with the US army. So I think to go back to that person saying, I'm an American floors me because yeah. that's what I think we, are not doing enough to explain the Jews are Americans and Jews. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's interesting because I think the American Jewish community made a concerted effort to make that argument for, for many decades throughout American history. And I think there is a reticence um, in some quarters to feel like we should have to engage in that discussion at this point of this idea that like Jews should have to prove that they are American. I think there's some discomfort with that because it's sort of like, well, why should we like it that almost suggests that it is a genuine debate that you can have. So, you know, but but I hear I hear what you're saying. And, and the fact that people don't know that, you know, is is a, a red flag. Yes, I think it's very important that we Jews make clear to people that we serve in the United in Congress. I mean that we are part of the American fabric. And yeah. I love what you said to your friend about how you educated the person. I think all of us, and I'm including myself, tend to just label people. So that we Jews ourselves may be saying, labeling people in ways that then give other people permission to label us. Yeah. So can you give us some examples of things that perhaps that you've covered that you, you've seen where the American Jewish community could have worked better? I don't mean to, we're not naming names, but in other words, what have you learned that you can share with us that we can do better in terms of, of explaining ourselves or confronting anti-Semitism in the United States? And, and here I'm talking about anti-Semitism less than anti-Zionism. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how, how one can go about doing that. Um, I do think that um, building, building relationships is one of the one of the biggest things just to open those lines of communication and, and to your point that once the labels start coming out the discussion largely shuts down because the person who has been labeled is now on the defensive and the labeler has seemingly already made up you know his or her or their mind and so you know i remember uh i don't know if it was a couple of years ago or last year but um rashida talib in uh michigan the the congresswoman there who's been you know accused of of um, you know anti-Semitism periodically uh, did she appeared on the cover of the Detroit Jewish News um, and that was you know and they had a little bit of a backstory of how you know the the Jewish media in Detroit built up a relationship with her office and you know and then she had a forum to to speak directly to the community and you know my guess is that most people who disagree with her positions on Israel probably still do but I think it's humanizing on on both ends because. It lets you know the people reading that publication who are you know very engaged members of the community hear directly from this person who they may have been told doesn't like them or may have seen a tweet that you know kind of rankled them and then for you know uh the congresswoman and her her staff and office it shows that like the jewish community in this case journalists are are happy and eager to engage and give a fair hearing and explain where she's coming from and so i think things like that are are really important you know the forward recently did a story about the uh, the sort of street attack in Los Angeles at the sushi restaurant during the the May fighting um, between Israel and, and Hamas and um, and you know and and our reporter out there 
track down the the folks who were you know accused in the attack who had been arrested and talked to their attorney and you know really tried to to again give a fair hearing um now you know that might be a more black and white case and again i don't know that a lot of like our readers were necessarily won over but i think you know the minute that we shut down and just say well we're just not going to talk because we put these people in a box with a label on it um you know it, it's over now I make some allowances for, I don't know that we need to interview every neo-Nazi out there or people who are proudly anti-Semitic and saying, I don't like Jews. I think those people might be a little bit more okay to label, but everything else, this huge gray area we have, I think it's really important to keep, keep the conversation going. I read that article because I'm in LA in the forward about, and afterwards it wasn't that I was convinced one way or the other, I still thought there's a lot more to this story than even- Always, right. right? Yeah. Yeah, I started out in life as a journalist. So I, I realized that even when you think, and I'm not talking about this particular reporter, you think you're being totally fair. It's just really hard to get at the truth. You know, that famous line from the TV show House, Everyone Lies. Well, I don't know if everyone lies, but everyone sees the world the way he or she sees it. Right. So, you know, those famous movies, Rashomani, look at all the different points of view. Yeah. So what the American Jewish community is faced with we have thousands, you know, all those jokes about how many different opinions Jews have, but how do we work as a community to educate? And while many states are now starting to get a Holocaust education mandated, then there's this huge problem with who comes up with the curriculum and how is it taught? And that's a real problem that I fear. In terms of you have a teacher who really doesn't mean to be offensive, but literally doesn't know any better. And he or she then takes the curriculum and twists it in ways that are not, that are offensive. We have no way of knowing what to do in that, uh, of even knowing that that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that comes with the territory of any kind of broad mandate is like the upside is you get it into thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands of classrooms. And the downside is you're not going to be able to monitor hundreds of thousands of classrooms. Um, you know, I, I saw a, uh, a clip on social media recently of this history teacher who was telling, like, he was trying to tell the audience about this cool lesson plan that he had done. And the premise was that he tricked his students into uh, voting for Hitler. And the premise was that uh, he did like a hypothetical, like they did a unit on, you know, European history. And then he had like a mock election where he said, you know, the year is, is 2030 or 2040. And, you know, the United States has just been defeated in a world war and they're bankrupt and da, 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 you know, sort of trying to, to explain Germany between the two world wars. And, you know, and then there were these different candidates you could pick and, you know, and, and inevitably the Hitler candidate would win the one who wanted to reassert dominance and, you know, all of that, all of that stuff. And, and then he would slowly reveal, okay, well, this candidate was, you know, some of the obscure German candidates or, you know, this candidate's Mussolini, who's not in Germany, but go figure. And then, you know, and then the, you know, people realize, oh no, you know, we voted for Hitler. And, you know, listening to that, I was like, okay, I get what you're saying, right? That you're trying to explain how a country can slip into totalitarianism. But if you're not really careful with that lesson, you're just humanizing people who support the Nazis because you're basically presenting like, look how reasonable the Nazi platform was. You would have supported it too. Um, and, and so I was listening to that. And of course it was a short clip, so I don't know the whole story, but I was like, I don't know how to feel about this. And I believe he was a teacher in uh, a state, I don't recall the state, but a state with a small Jewish population. So maybe he was in a big city where there were more Jews. But I was like, you know, if you're doing this in a classroom with, with no Jewish students or with one Jewish student, how is that going over? And and so that was, and that's a case where I think he had great intentions. And so, you know, exactly to your point, I was like, huh, yeah, the more that we encourage people to teach about this, you know, then you got to see like, what does that look like? And I know in Florida, there was recently a story where like a, I think a Christian Zionist, uh, kind of conservative evangelical Christian Zionist group got control of the curriculum and kept inserting things into the curriculum. Um, that, that did not line up with what the ADL or the other mainstream Jewish groups wanted. And I was like, well, that's not, you know, that's not right. You know, that doesn't seem good. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a really tricky, it's a really tricky topic, subject. If you have time, for anyone listening, episode three of this podcast is an interview with Lisa Weimer, who's why a fiction novel, The Assignment, has been winning awards. It is a fabulous book. 
it's actually uh, inspired by a true story of an assignment in New York in 2017. But now she get because the book came out, I think a year ago, she gets emails and, you know, social media contacts from people who are telling her about all kinds of terrible school assignments. And the problem is that while the teacher may think that this is encouraging critical thinking skills, you have to really look in context if they don't know any better what these students might be learning. Yeah. So I am concerned about how Holocaust education, and in the interview, Lisa says one thing that I have been thinking about for days, uh, when uh, she talks about the particular incident, and I don't even remember where it was, they, go, they went to the teacher and they said, how can you teach, you know, the teacher said, well, I didn't make this up. This comes from Brown University curriculum, which, and so they followed through with Brown University, which said, oh, well, we don't do that curriculum. So not that curriculum anymore, but as Lisa says in the podcast, but there's no recall. You right. recall a so all those people who bought the curriculum are still teaching it. Yeah. They think that they're doing, that they're not anti-Semitic because it's Brown University. Yeah, yeah. No, and I mean, you know, and, and you see this, the, the far more common case, because, you know, um, this, this comes up more often, uh, is in teaching about slavery, you know, you'll have these African American students in class who are given an assignment where it's like, you know, well, write, you know, write the pros and cons of, of slavery, or write from the perspective of a slaveholder about why you don't want to give up your, your slaves. And, you know, and it's like, again, yes, Critical thinking is great, and we have to think about how this assignment is going to land for everyone. And you know, it's it's a different assignment, right? To say, you know, uh, read the perspective or write from the perspective of an enslaved person uh, than it is th the reverse. And so, but it's like, but that requires, I wouldn't think it requires that much nuance to to know, but it does require some, you know, some thinking. And now that we're seeing school curriculums become, I mean, they've always been political, but they're becoming more political than ever, you know, all the stuff around, you know, how we teach about race and racism. Um, you know, I, I think it's a risk, right? You know, is Holocaust education going to become politicized? So far, there's not a huge indication that that's the case. There was a thing in Florida, there was a weird incident in, in Louisiana, um, but- oh, uh, when, And in Louisiana, when they withdrew the, the request for education, because it was going to be combined with something. Yeah, it, it was sort of, it sounded like there was sort of an out there lawmaker who, who had some like views that it was like, you know, the Democrats supported, but yeah, the Jewish community seemed to like kind of withdraw a little bit of its support from the, from the legislation. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't personally cover it, but you know, the difference is the, I, I would say that anti-Semitism, combating anti-Semitism in the United States is divided into two camps. One is focused on Holocaust education and other education. And that, uh, you know, that takes up a lot of, of time and resources and that, you know, they're making progress on that. The other half is devoted to how we talk about Israel. On the how we talk about Israel side, there are very clear battle lines between basically people who, who think that a lot of criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic and should be uh, shut down and people who think that it's okay and should be allowed and that you shouldn't politicize anti-Semitism, et cetera. On the Holocaust education side, there are not two sides. It's, it's less exciting, there's less money behind it, it doesn't get people fired up, but at least the Jewish community is not torn apart over how to teach the Holocaust. Um, and so that's you know one, one positive, uh, but that doesn't mean that it always goes smoothly when you get into a random, random legislature or a classroom. Yes, or when for my uh, nonfiction Holocaust theater project, Then Edge of the Wedge, when we've met with organizations who've said, well, teachers can't teach plays. And, and I say, well, it's not a play performance. It's, it's a witness testimony. And they go, oh no, they can't. Which is interesting because this is really a plug for my play, but a German, they call it a high school teacher in um, Heidelberg paid for the translation of my play into German. And then he used it in his 10th grade class. And he, he talked first about the Holocaust. Then he showed a 15 minute and pretty, as he said, pretty brutal um, clips from Auschwitz from the 75th anniversary liberation. And then, he, then the students did uh, read parts of the play and that was the whole purpose. So while it may sound like Holocaust education is, is agreed upon, there's a lot of pushback right. doing anything that hasn't been done before. 
Oh no, we, we, here, and I, I won't name the organization. Look, we have all these pamphlets about it. Oh, that's nice. That yeah. teens don't respond to pamphlets. They respond to uh, personal stories. Sure. So I agree with you, but we need to push those boundaries of what Holocaust education means, I think. Right. Yeah, there's all sorts of messiness around how you do Holocaust education, but there's at least not two uh, defined sides of yeah. it, you know, so it's, it, which, for better and for worse, maybe if there were two sides, you could just pick your side and, and get that pushed through. But but yeah, instead, there are all these like little fractures and, and stuff. So yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good point. And, but I think, you know, and the Jewish community cannot be, I mean, I don't, it wouldn't be good to be one-sided about anti-Zionism. So that's the flip side. We want people to think, have different opinions. It's just how it plays out. Yeah, yeah. So do you have something as we as we wrap up? Do you have something that you that you're burning to share about this topic that we haven't touched on? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think you covered a lot of good ground. I would say, um, you know, the story that I'm working on right now, which will probably be out by the time this is uh, online, and if not, uh, shortly thereafter, um, is about this new poll that came out on Tuesday that got a lot of attention um, because it. it ask American Jews what they did and didn't consider anti-Semitic, which is helpful because there's not a lot of great data on it. Um, and, you know, they asked what side of the political spectrum do you see it coming from? You know, how safe do you feel? But the other thing they asked was on this question around Israel, they said, you know, they tried to ask people, uh, do you think it's anti-Semitic to accuse Israel of genocide? Do you think it's anti-Semitic to accuse Israel of, you know, apartheid? Um, but the way that they set up the question said, you know, uh, do you agree or disagree with this statement, and if you disagree, do you think it's anti-Semitic? Um, and and very high numbers of American Jews uh, agreed that Israel was an apartheid state and was committing genocide. Uh, you know, much higher, at least on the genocide question, than I would have expected. Something like twenty percent of American Jews. I saw that number. Yes. Something. And um, and you know, and I think that that poses a really interesting question in this debate. So it was almost equal numbers, slightly higher thought it was anti-Semitic, then believed it was true. But it's like, what do you do if you take these very divisive issues and 20% of American Jews are saying, oh yeah, I believe that, I think that's true. And the other, another 20% are saying, that's anti-Semitic if you say that, right? So I think that just shows how uh, far apart American Jews are when it comes to uh, what is anti-Semitic, um, what, is, what is true, what position should our leaders take, um, and so, you know, I think that just really underscores the diversity of opinion. I think that's really important to keep in mind on all these things. You know, I, you were mentioning, right, that it's good that we have multiple opinions on these different things. Uh, whether it's good or bad, I think it wouldn't be the Jewish community if we did not have, you know, the, the joke is more, more opinions than we have, you know, people, right? And so, you know, I think it's just important to keep that in mind when it comes to anti-Semitism too, you know? People say, well, it's a shame that we can't all agree on anti-Semitism. And I see where they're coming from. But I, I think it's like, it's just like any other issue. Um, and so there are a lot of people doing a lot of really interesting work on it. Um, but I would just ask, you know, your, your viewers and listeners to, to keep in mind uh, that, you know, um, there's another opinion out there. Whatever they've heard, someone else thinks something else. Um, and, you know, to, to, to keep an open mind. I think that's very, very important. And also, as someone who, uh, went to business school, graduate business school, I don't trust any survey because what I learned is you ask the, you, you can craft a question to get the answer that you want. So it's only, those numbers are very suspect. It's so easy to say yes or no to that kind of question. So I'm not so sure, and you're writing the article, not me, how relevant those numbers are, but they do show how far apart American Jews are. And I agree with you. We would not all want to agree on everything. We want to have the ability to bring out different points of view, but nicely, not threatening anyone. Ideally, ideally. Being respectful of other people's views and the context that they bring. And Arnold, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us your thoughts. And thank you listeners. And I highly recommend that everyone watch the Never Again Is Now documentary that Evelyn Marcus is in. It's about the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe and it's very informative. And you can check out my play at finedgeofthewedge.com. And until next time, whenever you can, without risking physical danger for yourself, speak.
speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate. 